Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Finance and Men Committee meeting of Thursday, February 11th, 2021. Um, I am calling this meeting to order. Has roll call been done? Through you, Chair. Yes, roll call has been taken. Thank you, Connie. Uh, is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest or the general nature thereof? I see none. Um, can I get an adoption of the minutes of our meeting held on January 14th? Moved by Councillor Bro, seconded by Councillor Peckett. Are there any errors or omissions? Okay, I have one. Uh, it is noted that uh, Glenn Doncaster is the vice chair. In fact, it is Brian Hunt. So I will just ask Connie to make, um, to make that change. Uh, and with that, I will call for the vote. All in favor? Thank you. And uh, at this time, I wanna welcome uh, Allison Burkett from Camp Lutherlin Board. Uh, Allison, you can take yourself off, uh, off mute and uh, do your delegation. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, just during a sound check, you can hear me. I'm the, uh, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you today. I'm the treasurer of uh, Camp Lutherlin and uh, Janice Virch is our board chair. She unfortunately has back-to-back -back meetings this morning and couldn't join us. So I'm here today to talk to you about our request for a property tax uh, exemption. And I believe the slides will be put up on the screen or uh, you are seeing them then in think, front of you. Uh, was Sean, Sean, were you going to do that for us? There we go. And uh, Allison, just so you know, uh, when we when we uh, share a screen, some of us have to go dark, um, or our, our uh, or it sucks up our bandwidth. So just I'm here, <laughs> you go ahead, but I may have to go dark. Okay, we're all internet. I understand. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So, in talking about a uh, request for exemption under the, for property tax. I wanna do a little bit of background in that uh, this is part of the Ontario Property Assessment Act. And the, um, it was written in 1990. And section three is the section that we are most familiar with that provides for exemptions of the act. Um, and so under section three, it talks about churches, places of worship are exempt from property tax. So are cemeteries and the like, and so are a whole number of nonprofit groups. What's significant is that no bylaws are required to be enacted to grant these exemptions. Next, please. Next slide, please. We're applying under section four and section four is a little known section of the act. Uh, it was added in 2006 and it's entitled the exemption for religious organizations. And it has two parts to it. Yes. Section four one says that the land of a religious organization is exempted from tax if it's owned by the organization and used solely for recreational purposes. Section two of the act says that the council of municipality may pass bylaws exempting from tax other than school taxes and local improvement rates, uh, this land. The significant part of that is that bylaws must be passed to grant section four. And in fact, there only are three sections of the act that provide for exemptions. Section three, the big one from back from 1990, and then in 2006, this section four was added as was section six, which is where the Royal Canadian Legion exemption used to be. Next slide, please. So we're requesting uh, exemption from property tax under section four on two properties. And the numbers here are the assessment values in um, 2020. So we're asking for all of 201 Lutherland Drive. It's 14 acres. And we're asking for it all to be deemed recreational use as an assessment of $222,000. We're asking for a partial uh, property tax exemption under section four for 909 Zato Road. It's a more complicated property and I'll show you that in the map. It has 130 acres and the recreational use portion we're asking for is uh, assessment of 92,283. This was part of, this process was started with a uh, request for reconsideration to MPAC for both these properties back in November of 2019. And MPAC uh, coached us and advised us through this process of looking at our property tax. 
And in fact, uh, helped us uh, apply for the farm property tax class on part of the property that you'll see in a moment. Um, that was went to AgriCorp and was approved in July of 2020. And they have coached and advised us through applying for the section four exemption for recreational use, which you'll see later has been approved by the township of uh, Bonshire Valley, the lower tier. Next slide, please. So this is the property. Uh, north is roughly to the right. Um, we are two properties. Uh, next slide, please, advance. The first one is 201 Lutherland Drive, which is a small property at the top of the slide. Um, just a moment, please. The, um, uh, it's the 14 acre property. It has beachfront and vacant land, uh, basically trails and so on. And at some point we'll probably allow camping on that property. And that's what we call Hoffman Beach on, on, um, on Golden Lake. Next, please, advance. The next property is 909 Zato Road. That's a larger 130 acre property. Uh, it has a small beach front on Golden Lake, what we call Bancroft Beach. Next, please. And this is the one that has, uh, um, is more complicated. So we applied for the farm tax exemption for two fields um, that are, are farmed and have been for years by Irvin Hoffman and Sons. And they're marked in the red or orange red. If you look at the pie chart at the bottom, those farm properties account for 14% by assessment dollars. Okay, not by acreage, obviously. 14% of the 909 Zato property. 8%, I can't show you where on the map it is. It is a portion that has been deemed exempt for worship use back since the camp's uh, inception in 1965 or back when the Assessment Act came into place in 1990. I'm not sure which, but for a lot of years. We're requesting a 16%, the dark blue, for recreational use, uh, and that's by assessment dollars. All of these, um, all of these calculations were done by MPAC, okay, in terms of deeming what portion uh, is in each of these parts. And the remaining part is deemed to be residential use, so it's 62% of this property. The residential uh, part, all of, almost all of our buildings are between those two farm fields, so they're kind of across the middle. I can't exactly point on this, uh, but we have a four season lodge that's open in the summer and winter. Uh, then we have a big dining hall, eight bunk cabins, uh, two other specialty cabins in that section of the property, uh, plus recreational area in there. And we have one cabin down on the beach, on Bancroft Beach, down by Golden Lynn Way. So they represent 62% of the property. Next slide, please. So this is how our property is used recreationally as we've got two beaches, we've got about four and a half kilometers of trails used summer and winter. Uh, we have some fun stuff. So we have canoes and volleyball net and horseshoe pits and a gaga pit and a baseball field and we do archery there and so on as well. People can bring in their own um, and do bring in their own kayaks and paddle boards and so on on the beaches and, uh, and other things. Next please. So we're asking for four reasons to approve the exemption. First of all, MPAC confirmed that they meet the requirements of the first part of section one um, and has calculated the portion that is recreational use. We worked with Alyssa Virch, uh, property valuation analyst from MPAC. Um, she was assigned as the request for a reconsideration analyst. And she consulted both in spring, as I said, she advised us on the applying to AgriCorp and then and she consulted both in the spring as we were looking for the section four going to the township. And again, in the fall, um, as we were looking at bringing forward to the county with the impact legal interpretation department, they all agree that we meet section four one. So the owners are registered charities, et cetera. Next slide, please. Section two, as I mentioned earlier, the lower tier has approved our exemption uh, in July of 2020 and enacted a bylaw. So now we need county approval. So county approval reduces the administrative burden on the township to administer it. So you'll see on your screen a quote from MPAC. Uh, it basically says that once it's fully executed, i.e. both tiers um, have approved it, then the computer programs are updated and everything kind of works appropriately. Next, please. The third reason 
No, it, it's not required in the Assessment Act that you that you prove this, but implicitly, I think these exemptions are in place because they're perceived to be a public benefit. So I just want to talk to you that the camp does benefit Renfrew County families. We had 105 kids attending camp in 2019, which is our last real year, hopefully. We had 88 other kids and staff for camps that were are run in combination with our staff. Um, OPP runs a camp for Aboriginal children at Camp Lutherland. A Phoenix Centre out of Pembroke ran a camp in 2019 for some of their kids. And we have somebody in, in Ottawa who brings in people from China to do an English camp in an English class in Ottawa, and then he brings them out to Camp Lutherland for a, a camp for a week. Um, and he's been doing that for several years. We had 470 other people renting, 21 groups. Our rental groups are quilting retreats, uh, family reunions, big and small church retreats. We hire and buy mostly from Renfrew Ren Ren County. Um, we, in 2019, we had 11 summer staff plus two cooks. Um, property and cleaning is contracted out. There's a lot of work to keep the, the, the camp, all the various aspects of it, um, you know, from fire extinguishers and smoke detectors and, and gas to propane stoves and all the types of specialty equipment. We spend about 20,000 a year on routine. And then over the last two years and this, this current year, we've spent a considerable amount on projects. You see the, the numbers in front of you and I'll talk more about that in a moment. We have congregations, Lutheran congregations who support the camp. Um, I believe that there were originally eight congregations that built the, the bunk cabins and they continue to um, congregations within the Renfrew County and beyond continue to support the camp through property work, um, spring and fall work days and financial donations to the camp. And finally, on the, um, just showing kind of the benefits, we circulated an online petition to uh, asking for people from Renfrew County to, to look at indicating their support. And we have, as of this morning, 120 people from Renfrew County that have signed it and I'm happy to provide a copy of that. Um, they range from Deep River, as probably as far north as we go, although I just uh, rented this morning from Laurentian Valley. I hadn't realized I could have asked them to look at uh, approaching it. And then through, down through Armpire, out to Quadville, Palmer, Rapids, etc. Next slide, please. The fourth reason is that let's talk about the money. The money we're asking you the, in county tax terms is very small. It's $1,150. We still pay over $1,300 in county tax for the residential and farm portion. So I think the report that came from finance in November that talks a different amount, it was over 2,400, was mistakenly assuming that all we were asking for an exemption on all the remaining part, but uh, we still do pay county taxes and we pay education taxes. As I said, uh, we did a part of a broader review of property tax and in total, when we and looking at what was achieved out of this, we had look at a reduction of $3,400 a year. So that's not chump change for us. I mean, even the 1150, our revenue from operations is about 120,000 in a good year. In a COVID year, it's a lot less than that. So 1150 sends three kids to camp for a week. It would pay for several months of hydro for the lodge in the winter time. Uh, it would have paid it for our, our uh, our support for a Canada summer job student this year where we have to do a top up if we want a, a summer, summer student. I told you about a significant amount of money that we spent on, on uh, capital improvements over three year period. That was from, uh, that money was from a legacy fund first that the camp supporters had been raising. And it goes back 15 years for new washrooms for the camp. That was one part of it. And the second bigger part is that we're a beneficiary of a camp that Senate owned uh, near Guelph that closed. So Senate owned three camps in Eastern Ontario, uh, two in Ontario, I'm sorry, in Eastern Canada, two in Ontario, one in Halifax. The camp that is, uh, was near Guelph got into problems with uh, maintenance of the property around the septic system in particular. And, uh, um, and just, it, it wasn't fixable, let's say. 
There is a lot of work. I, our camp is, was formed in 1965. You can imagine, you know, what properties are like, and it's, it's not just the buildings part of it, it's also the grounds part of it. We're fighting with erosion and other things. So we, we've got our property in reasonably decent shape. We still have a couple of major things that need to be done with this one-time capital fund, but we need to put back in place a capital reserve for the future things that are going to happen. We have more roofs and so on that are gonna need replacement in a couple of years. We have a septic tank that has five years left of its life. So savings from this are be used to keep our property in good shape and we're committed to keeping our camp and rental rates affordable. We're a charity, you know, none of this is going to profit any, any particular people. Next slide, please. And precedents, um, there are two. So finance report cited a precedent of there are at least 55 other properties that appear to be in a similar situation. So I'd had a chance to talk to, um, to Daniel and I see he's on the, the call this morning, the meeting this morning. And I'd raised my concern of saying that, are they really precedents? Are these 55 other properties? Um, he shared that the, the bulk of them were vacant parsonages owned by churches. And I'd questioned whether or not are they, are they in place today that are being used solely for recreational purposes or is it something that might happen down the road? I mean, our parsonage for my church out of uh, St. John's Lutheran out of Arn Prior, when our parsonage was vacant, it was sold. So a number of churches are making that decision for it. If they use it for other things such as childcare, it's exempt under section three. And I reached out to uh, Annette Gilchrist, who's the CAO of the Township of Monshire Valley, um, you know, in preparing for this. And she had, she had shared that she had also advised Daniel that it was it is his interpretation that those are precedents, but she does not agree with it. So I leave that with you and I raise also a favorable precedent, I think, for our request under process. I believe that you passed bylaws, I, I believe from at least a couple of jurisdictions, I know that you did and I would suspect you passed them for all of the Royal Canadian Legion clubhouses. They were exempt under many, for many years, 20, 2006 to 2018, under Section 6 of the Act, which had a similar provision as Section 4, requiring a bylaw. And it first went to the lower tier, and then it went to the upper tier for, for uh, exemption. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, the Act is in place. It has been for a lot of years. It provides for not-for-profit organizations to be exempt from taxation for doing good things. Um, MPACT <laughs> says they're, they're the experts on this. Our properties meet that requirement. The lower tier has passed it. We respectfully ask that you also grant us this property tax exemption. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. That was a <clears throat> very comprehensive explanation. I'm gonna open it up uh, to committee for questions. Councillor Donahue. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I wonder if uh, Allison might, uh, if the slide could be returned to the mapping. Uh, I'm somewhat uh, confused as to uh, what sections uh, are considered um, um, in, in the pie chart. Uh, there was, I think, identified a 16% section uh, that was the land seeking the exemption status for. Um, perhaps if she could, uh, yeah. The, uh, there's the pie chart, but also the lands underneath. I'm trying to grasp what differentiates uh, a, a um, recreational use from a residential use from a worship use. Well, um, I'm, I'm going to answer this via my rough understanding of how impact comes up with the it, it actually it's a, it is the slide before, not that I'm asking you to switch to that, but it's the dollar value. So if we look at um, by, by acreage, it's certainly not by acreage. Farm is not 14% of the land, but the farm properties were designated as being a, an assessment value of um, uh, whatever it is, 78,000 something of, uh, by impact in terms of, of what that was, sorry, what it is, 78,845. The worship percentage years ago, that percentage was set. Um, the 8% comes up as uh, 42,600. And 
our worship space is outdoors and so I don't know if it's it's by that so some mount was deemed we have a couple of areas that are worship areas at the camp um, I would suspect that they came back with uh, they they then looked at what portion remains residential so it's the value of the buildings and so on which really make up the residential portion and then uh, determine that the remaining value could be exempted from recreation like recreation space we can walk all the way, this is a snowmobile trail on the left-hand part of the left field. So, you know, we can walk down there around the farms and kind of up, we have uh, trails that go down to, uh, go down to the top property as well, down to Bancroft Beach, coming up around the other, uh, the other field and so on and back through the, the park. We have a whole playground uh, in the middle section between the two fields. Uh, that's where the volleyball net and the horseshoes and uh, just playground equipment and so on there. So that's the best I can, I can answer that. I hope that that helps. Thank you for that. Um, are there any other questions? Councillor Donahue. Uh, thank you uh, once again, uh, Madam Chair. Um, Alison, I also, uh, uh, Ms. Burkett, actually, I apologize. Um, I I'm trying to understand what the difference would be um, between um, a, a non-religious uh, camp uh, for, uh, for children uh, and your site. Um, this one uh, would be subject to the exemption, as I understand, because of the, the uh, connection with the, uh, the Synod. Uh, but those camps that are not, I'm thinking of perhaps like Camp Smitty uh, for the Ottawa Boys and Girls Club at Mink Lake, and what I guess I'm struggling with is, is what is the distinction between what they are doing and what you are doing? With all respect, I can't speak to the minds of the legislators who wrote the Assessment Act. So Camp Smitty is owned by the Boys and Girls Club of, of Ottawa. I'm quite familiar with it. And yes, they do good work. And yes, I might have wanted to say that they're not for profit and that they should be covered under Section 4 as well of the Act but they're not. Section 4 of the Act speaks only for land that is used by, that is owned by a religious organization and used exclusively for recreational use. So they do good stuff too. Okay. But, and but, I, that, and, and I acknowledge that uh, certainly you don't have the capacity to, to speak to that, nor do I, but that is certainly what I am struggling with. Well, to, to one, if I can add one more thing, if I look through the Assessment Act, it changes every single year. And in fact, you know, there was a lobby to move Royal Canadian Legion out of section six and back into section three. You know, I, I think that you could raise your voice and say section four should be extended to other not-for-profit organizations. And uh, to Councillor Dunahue's point, um, that question was asked at our council table as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, Annette had done some research and uh, she also didn't really want to speak to other not non profits, um, but did in fact talk about you know religious grounds. So, are there any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Puckett. Sorry. No worries. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm. In past meetings, uh, I think Mr. Foss has uh, given some information about the uh, the effect of of uh, um, granting this application would have throughout the county. I wonder if if that information could be brought back to uh, committee or or for the information of all of uh, county council. And the effect that that uh, granting of this application would have countywide. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Foss. Do you want to respond? Thank you, Chair. And certainly, uh, when uh, the meeting uh, transitions back to the report from Corporate Services, I will have additional comments to make. Excellent. Yes, I see it's uh, number one in your information. So we will take this under advisement. Thank you. Oh, Councillor Donahue. Sorry, thank you. I do apologize, Madam Chair. There was just one more. So, 
it, it, I went back to, uh, this seems, I think, the documentation that perhaps uh, uh, Bonisher Valley had uh, on the background. Uh, and it notes that uh, the land is to be owned by the organization. So uh, am I to understand then that, that you are acting, uh, Ms. Burkett, on behalf of the Eastern Synod as opposed to Camp Lutherland? I'm acting on both our behalfs. Uh, so we are the tenant and we are also a, um, a charity. And, um, but uh, yes, I'm acting on behalf of the Eastern Senate for both properties. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, well, we will be discussing this later on, um, but at this time, thank you so much, Allison. We really appreciate your delegation. All right. And now I will turn this over to Mr. Morrow uh, with his departmental report. Thank you, Chair. The departmental report can be found on page two of your report. First item in the report, if I may, is just is uh, communications. And the focus of that was the uh, our recent initiatives around the promotion and public input campaign and uh, support for the VTAC program, both at Roma and uh, all through social media. I think we are uh, having some great success uh, asking uh, local residents who have uh, utilized the VTAC uh, services to um, send their um, positive um, feedback to the Minister of uh, Health and the Premier, and that is ongoing. It also includes radio ads as well, and uh, we've had a bit of a campaign uh, promoting that. Um, if uh, maybe I'll leave it at that chair and if the warden wants to speak to our delegation with uh, Minister Elliott when we come back to them, um, I think it was very successful, but the warden uh, may have some comments as well. Um, also around the vaccination and testing messaging, and we're just supporting uh, public health in that. And a lot of that stems from the conversations we have at our weekly EOC meetings um, uh, with the uh, emergency uh, operations um, group. Number two, the ER and gig project, and just an attached a letter um, from the uh, um, from the East Ontario Wardens Caucus regarding uh, um, the support for for ER and the EOWC in it, its efforts to do a regional approach, uh, ensuring that um, how we get the best bang for the buck when it comes to uh, rolling out broad broadband in the County of Renfrew, and there will be more on that later in the report. Again, item number three, EORN Board of Directors. That was provided to committee and council outlining the rules and the process uh, for having a member uh, nominated. And there is an addendum report that will speak to that later on. Uh, would you like me to go on to bylaws, Chair? Um, why don't we just do information now and then we'll move on. Because you do have addendums, correct? Yes, yes. I do. Yeah. Okay. So we'll go back <clears throat> to information item number one, uh, communications. Gordon, did you wanna to speak to this? Definitely, um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Morrow. Um, absolutely, I think that um, anyone who attended Roma um, would have smiled quite a few times when they heard the, the words Renfrew County Virtual Triage and Assessment Center. Um, I'm sure it wasn't really front and center on everybody's mind, but it certainly seemed to be, and I had a you know, biased opinion of all of that. So when we finally had an opportunity to meet with uh, Minister Elliott, who I've been you know, hoping to meet for the past year. Um, she was very, very uh, engaging, very interested in VTAC. I, I came away uh, feeling very positive about it. I believe that she shares the, uh, the values that all of us share and the, and the understanding that every you know person in Ontario, Canada, but in, in Ontario and in Renfrew County should have the right to access primary care when they need. So it was very positive. Uh, Chair Donahue was at the uh, meeting as well, and I'm sure that he would uh, be more than happy to comment um, and add to anything that I'm saying here today. So thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Warden. Anything further on number one? All right, uh, number two, the ERN gig project. Um, I, anybody that was on the call um, the other day with General Hillier uh, will know that um, Steve Clark couldn't even get on the 
could get into the meeting because he lost bandwidth. So I think maybe Minister Clark needs to lobby um, his uh, his colleagues as well. Councillor Donahue. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I do apologize. This was uh, the second part with respect to the second part of item number one, the vaccination. Uh, and testing messaging, and while it is not uh, germane perhaps to the messaging itself, uh, just uh, yesterday we, we certainly did discuss this uh, at health committee. It was also part of uh, county council. We were uh, uh, very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Cushman as a delegation uh, yesterday on, uh, I believe it was the MyFM uh, web, uh, some a uh, presence on the web somewhere. Uh, the uh, indication was that the uh, vaccination rollout plan was going to be uh, made public uh, tomorrow. Now, I have no confirmation of that uh, directly, uh, either as a county councillor or as a board of health member, but that was for me in the media yesterday. Uh, I just wanted to bring that to uh, everyone's attention. Thank you for that. Um, all right, moving on, uh, the EORN board of directors. Seeing none. Mr. Morrow, I'll pass this back to you for bylaw. Uh, Chair, with your indulgence, I'll read the recommendation. Yes, please. That the Finance and Administration Committee recommend the County Council adopt the revised bylaw for remuneration of members of Council of the County of Renfrew effective January 1, 2021 at their next session of Council and further that bylaw 17-20 uh, be repealed. Thank you. I'll ask for a mover and seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Sweet, seconded by the Warden. Any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. All right. And we'll go to addendum number one, please. Addendum number one. Thank you. Um, I believe that would be item number five, the Municipal Modernization Program intake. Um, so, um, as recently as yesterday, uh, Chair, we have been back and forth with the province on this. Um, the, uh, the guidelines and the rules with respect to this application are gray at best. Uh, we received notification just several weeks ago regarding the second intake on this piece. If Council will recall the first intake that we, uh, we um, were successful in achieving was utilized to undertake the service delivery review, I believe. And uh, this now is for either implementation and um, for uh, or additional um, or an extension or a follow on contract for an additional service um, uh, delivery review. So knowing that um, um, staff are proposing that um, uh, we submit an application and that we have a resolution from council supporting that resolution, um, to be quite frank with you, um, we have kept this um, the parameters of it wide open until we learn more. Our challenge moving forward is that the deadline is March 15th, but we did want to get that council support uh, to move forward and have some broad guidelines around it. Um, Chair, before we read the resolution, um, can I speak to some of the things that we would consider applying for? By all means, please. So we would look at the development of an information technology um, or digital strategy. Now, again, Councillor Hunt uh, raised a, a suggestion, um, I believe at our last meeting. Um, again, we need to scope down those parameters, um, but I do believe that with respect to, to um, the development of information digital uh, strategy, I think in terms of scope of work, we have lots of opportunity here to look at things like um, the services that uh, we provide moving them, for example, um, online uh, planning applications, and Craig will talk that a little bit as an outcome. Um, we also have an opportunity to look at um, uh, some efficiencies through this digital strategy with our local municipal partners um, in terms of providing IT support. Again, that would require, before we ever moved on it, um, we would need to understand the costs associated with that and whether or not there was a willingness uh, from the local municipalities to come on board with that. But again, we must do our uh, background with that. The second item would be uh, find the implementation of the service delivery review recommendations that were proposed uh, in the first intake. And again, um, that is some of the things we're seeing come out of the planning um, uh, departmental review and how we deliver planning services. 
We're now hearing that there are some opportunities to go with electronic permitting and things like that, that will make um, those things more efficient and streamlined for our ratepayers and applicants. Number three, recommendations that are uh, anticipated to be forthcoming. Yeah, that's the third one, sorry. So those are the things that we are considering applying for. Um, Craig, maybe if I may, Chair, I will turn it over to Craig to talk about one, broadband, and uh, two, provide some clarification on that, and two, um, the uh, uh, Planning Division Service Delivery Review. By all means. Thank you, Chair, through you to, to committee, and good, good morning. Uh, so what development property heard on Tuesday was that uh, through economic development, we'd like to go forward with a broadband strategy uh, for the County of Renfrew. We understand and, and appreciate the relationship we have with the Eastern Ontario Regional Network, EORN, but um, there are certain local facts that we need to learn. We need to learn where the, the gaps are, if you will, and, and use some of the information EORN is getting and, and ground truth that a little bit further. We've talked about this before, and I know Councillor Hunt is, is uh, keen to get this moving. What we are looking at, I've reached out to my peers in other counties. Northumberland County, for example, has just recently launched uh, over the past year, year and a bit, uh, an RFP for a, a consultant to do some work on how they could expand um, internet to the homes in that area. And ultimately that, that has resulted in another RFP out to technology providers, which has now resulted in looking like Northumberland County is going to be a utility of internet providing. Uh, and they alone will go out with those uh, TSPs, the internet service providers now, technology service, service providers, to an application on the uh, ICON and the Universal Broadband Fund. So that they, there's a number of steps to get there, um, but ultimately they're hoping to bring 98% of their homes, fiber to homes or internet to homes with one meg download speed uh, in Northumberland County. Listen, we all recognize Northumberland County is not Renfrew County, a little bit different 401, 401 corridor flat, uh, but this is, this is a, a solution that they're working with a number of uh, proponents, including Hydro One Networks and, and some of the other um, folks to make this happen. All in with private investments such, it's about 50 to $75 million, I believe, of investment going on in there. So that's just an example of, of a broadband strategy that has is a result of upfronting a strategy uh, to find out where your gaps are. So that's, we looked at this being incorporated into the modernization fund. It doesn't quite fit with this strategy. So we're reaching out to people like the CFTC and the province, um, the RED program on funding this strategy moving forward. So uh, Paul and I worked on trying to make it fit, but it's just a little bit of a, a disconnect. So that's the broadband piece. EORN, um, a few years back, created a, a great e-government toolkit for, uh, for Eastern Ontario and for others. And part of that is how to streamline development approvals uh, that are at the county and uh, lower tier level and the coordinating all of that amongst other items, including procurement and a whole bunch of other things going on in e-government. But we're wrapping up the, the planning service delivery review over the next few weeks uh, by the end of February. And I, I expect to hear that there's ways to streamline how we work with developers and landowners and the regular citizenry who are just trying to do something simple on their lands and trying to streamline that application process to make it less paper heavy and more focused on being digital and, um, and, and be check mark type based and, and get those development approvals, uh, at least inquiries out much faster than perhaps we've been doing so far. So hopefully this strategy will lead to, to getting that done. Thank you and I see Paul's hand. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and we certainly heard at a health committee yesterday uh, with, our, with our seniors housing strategy that um, those approvals need to be faster and, and, and a, little, uh, a little more lenient. Yep, go ahead, Paul. Thank you, Chair. The, the challenge moving forward is, will be this. Um, when we spoke to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs uh, on two occasions as recently as yesterday, they essentially said that when you look at the pot of money, you will be eligible for about 250 some thousand dollars. So very similar to last time. So we have a limited funding um, envelope here that we can apply for. Uh, she has indicated uh, to us that we can apply um, for as many projects as we want, 
and we can apply for individual applications to both streams. So one stream would be for um, an additional service delivery review component to learn more. The second stream would be for implementation on the ground work uh, to, do, um, to deliver and move forward on some of the things we learned in our last plan. So our focus moving forward will be things like electronic records management, which is a result of our first service delivery review. Um, it will be looking at the uh, human resources software, the one window planning software, moving to electronic tenders, um, electronic agendas and meetings. And um, it will be looking at improving some of our GIS applications and tools as part of this application. Um, I just wanna be clear with respect to the broadband piece that Craig was speaking to, we have a, a couple opportunities. There's either red funding or Craig is currently speaking with CFTC right now on that opportunity to get uh, receive funding from those groups. So we would do that outside of this particular initiative. Our challenge is again, um, timing will be critical to get the application in. Um, the warden and then Craig. Thank you, Chair. And um, Paul clarified that. I just want to make sure that I was clear too that you know our our need for broadband won't won't be addressed in any way with this in this application. Um, but what I think is interesting that all the things that we would like to include in the application require on, require broadband to be in place. So um, you know, <laughs> the just, irony is not just lost. just pointing it out. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, Craig. Thanks, Jan. Through you, I just wanted to add to Paul's uh, notes. Perhaps is that part of of our reaching out to folks is the continuation. I think Paul's continuation and Council's con continuation of having YouTube or streamed meetings and the upgrades required to that are, that are being made into the Council Chamber. So I think part of those uh, part of the strategy, again, part of the SDR and, and moving forward with this, is trying to see if we can still accommodate some of our needed changes on a digital platform in council chambers moving forward. And I think that's, uh, just want to add to, the, to Paul's comments. Those amendments. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hunt. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Through you to uh, um, Mr. Morrow. Are we, and you may have said it and I might've missed it, but are we thinking of applying both as a group and as Renfrew County? So two applications? because uh, we phoned and they are certainly open to that. And the last time the grant came out, uh, anyone that applied as a group, everyone was accepted. So are we considering that? Uh, thank you, Chair, through you to Councillor Hunt. Um, it said the staff recommendation is that we apply as the County of Renfrew, just given the number of things that we, uh, could apply for in the limited amount of funding that we have access to. So it's not a big pot. Um, I think if we applied as a group, it would dilute that for us. We have enough things on our list here that would um, that would most clearly uh, fill our needs. It, to be frank, what we're trying to do and what we're putting in front of committee today is casting a very wide net um, in hopes that we um, are able to get secure as much funding for the County of Renfrew as possible. Then we would come back um, and better define exactly the use of those funds uh, through committee and council uh, should we be successful. But to, to, to answer your question, um, we think we have, a, we have a quite a long list of things stemming from our original service delivery review, the council chamber's renovations, where, and again, given the timing, the March 15th deadline, it takes a significant amount of coordination. So there's a number of, of factors or hurdles um, that, um, that uh, I think restrict us uh, from applying as a much larger group. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, and I, I think you uh, you just addressed what I was going to respond to Councillor Hunt with, is the short timeline is not ideal when you want to do a collaboration. Yeah. It's a very quick turnaround. Councillor Donahue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you to uh, Mr. Morrow, uh, and, or Mr. Kelly, perhaps, uh, the appropriate uh, individual. Um, given the discussion of the, the um, upscoping, if you will, of our, our digital capabilities from a, uh, the council chamber, uh, the uh, live streaming, the extra, I think, $300,000, is that 
what we are discussing uh, of of uh, using utilizing the funding for uh, because if that was the case is that then going to displace uh, the requirements uh, we just had that report at county council with respect to or sorry at the budget uh, meeting with respect to the service delivery improvement program and the extra three hundred thousand dollars that was going to be required and and essentially amortized uh, through our savings so is that going to displace that in which case then we would have a lot more latitude uh, of what we could apply those savings towards and not as constrained perhaps by uh, whatever uh, uh, prescriptive uh, elements would be attached to this. Go ahead, Paul. Thank you, Chair. Uh, through you to Councillor Donahue. Um, again, you know, as we indicated, we're trying to cast a broad, as, a broad of net as possible. Um, so with the hope that some of these items would be covered and we would not have to use levy dollars to um, undertake that project. Will we be approved? You know, as recently as yesterday afternoon in my conversation with staff from Municipal Affairs, they could not give me a definitive answer whether or not we could use these dollars for capital or operating. So um, it is our hope that we could um, apply some of those. It is implementation of our original service delivery review recommendations. We would hope that would be eligible. But again, that would be my intent. Once we receive approvals, we would better define exactly how the money would be utilized. Should we be successful, bring it back to committee and get committee's endorsement of those items. And then uh, through Mr. Foss, we would have a conversation of um, how that would work with respect to our uh, uh, you know, accounting principles that we do follow. So uh, maybe Mr. Foss has something to add to that. Uh and through you, Chair, thank you. Good morning, Finance Committee. Um, you know, I think uh, I would certainly be in agreement with what the CAO has said. Um, you know, um, we, we have a couple of options and a couple of opportunities in front of us. Uh, some of these funding streams are somewhat restrictive. Uh, some of the funding streams we are led to believe are a little bit more flexible and may open the door to uh, expenditures of a capital nature. But as always, the devil remains in the details of these funding programs. And before we are able to, to state definitively what we can use for what purposes, uh, you know, we need to see the, uh, the details of some of these, these other funding grants, uh, if you will. Uh, so we will certainly bring forward to you um, our staff recommendations when we do get a little bit more clarity on, on some of these um, different grant options. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's it's kind of frustrating when they're rolling out these uh, these programs and, and the programs are great, but a little clarity would certainly help our cause. Uh, I saw the warden and then Councillor Donahue. Thank you, Chair. And just to remind committee, I think it was in um, late November that um, we had our meeting with uh, Minister Yakubuski and we did talk about the safe restart funds and the use of those funds. Um, and we made a, um, a case, I believe a strong case at that point, that the renovations to the um, council chambers while capital in nature were operational in need and that we want to be able to use 300,000 from the Safe Start Refund, or straight Safe Start Fund to, uh, for the council chambers. Um, we didn't, uh, I've never heard back exactly from uh, Minister Clark's office. So last week I did send another email requesting again that we would be able to use that those funds, but um, so far, no response. Thank you for that. Councillor Donahue. Yeah, a couple of points. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm presuming, though, that by the time we get to Council, uh, that the application has to articulate or enumerate the specific uh, projects that we anticipate using the funding for. So at this point, where it may be uh, unknown, um, by the time the application is going to be submitted, I'm fairly certain we cannot put unknown uh, in the application. So by that time, I'm sure we will know. With respect to what the funding is, uh, certainly, uh, absolutely, we will abide uh, by whatever measures. But I think that and I, I have all confidence in staff uh, to do this, uh, is that I think that we have uh, within us the ability to be nimble enough to reallocate funds uh, that would not uh, be utilized or would not be consistent perhaps with the funding program uh, that in fact we could perhaps spend levy dollars on uh, and displace those levy dollars uh, with funds that have uh, more strings attached 
so I think that this does require, you know, I'm a farmer. Uh, I will uh, assure you that I have, have become uh, somewhat experienced and adept uh, at uh, understanding what the nature of these programs are. And I have all confidence that staff has that same capacity. Thank you. All right. So if the, oh, Councillor Rose. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and just for clarification, and this is more in regards to the Euron project, is I know uh, we've had contact from some of the local service providers looking for support, uh, sharing information. I'm just curious, is the county leading this, this project to extend internet and increase uh, speed and service countywide? Or... Uh, are we as individual lower tiers also, because our strategic plan when we did it last year, that was one of the top priorities that our residents identified was uh, more speed and more reliability when it comes to broadband and internet. So uh, maybe if I could just get some clarification, I would certainly appreciate it. Thanks. I think Paul would like to respond to that. Thank you, Chair. Through you to Councillor Bros. Um, staff has, has not received direction to lead it on behalf of the county at this point. Um, to be frank, it's been a hodgepodge in terms of the county has been writing letters of support. We have been endorsing individual local projects uh, for municipalities. Uh, what Craig is proposing, though, is that we do the, uh, uh, the analysis of what could be done across the county and, again, continue to support EORN in those efforts. So it has been a multi-pronged approach at the local level, at the county level, and through support for the Eastern Ontario Regional Network. So again, I, you know, hats off to the warden in terms of her role as chair of the EOWC. You'll see in this report and other reports where she as the chair of the EOWC continues to advocate for a much broader regional report, uh, approach so that we uh, do achieve economies of scale and we are able to better serve our ratepayers. But at the same time, Chair Bros um, or Councillor Bros, uh, I believe that um, this work that we plan to do for the County of Renfrew will better solidify who does what um, in the next coming months um, as it relates to rolling out broadband for the County of Renfrew. Thank you. I just didn't want to close the door on any one approach at this point. Thank you, no, Chair. I, I really appreciate that, Paul. That, uh, that gives me a bit more clarity as well. Um, Warden. Thank you, Chair. And I just want to refer to um, Mr. Kelly's comments too about trying to find some grant money through the RED program. And I don't know if this is CFTC, Craig, I'm not sure if that's what you said. But I think, you know, so absolutely, if EOR went through, it would be, it would, it would be the answer to our, a lot of our issues here in the County of Renfrew. But that being said, if it doesn't happen, we can't just sit and wait for one to happen and then start reacting. So if we can get some funds and have a broadband strategy for the County of Renfrew, whether or not we ever have to move forward with that strategy. That, that if we don't, we don't. But um, I think we have to start moving uh, in that direction. Um, you know, Councillor Hunt, um, every meeting, no matter what the committee is, he does bring up broadband, good for him. And every one of our council meetings, local tiers, we all, we talk about it at almost every one of our meetings as well. So I think we need to have a strategy. We can, we can do that. If Eorn comes to fruition, then that's fantastic as well. Thank you, Warden. All right, with that, Paul, would you like to read the uh, resolution? Yes, Chair, it's a lengthy one. Recommendation that the Finance and Administration Committee recommend that staff be directed to complete an application under the Municipal Modernization Program Intake 2 by the March 15th, 2021 deadline, and further that the application focus on the development of an information technology slash digital strategy, implementation of service delivery review recommendations, and projects that were pro proposed in the first intake and improvements to the planning department's application process as a result of the background report. And further that, if approved for funding, staff will report back to committee and council to, re to recommend on a cost sharing budgetary, uh, budgetary implications. Thank you. So I'll ask for a mover and seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Hunt, seconded by Councillor Bros. Any further discussion? Warden. 
Thank you, Chair. Just to follow up with uh, Councillor Donahue's comments. So in the recommendation or in the resolution, it says recommendations from the service delivery review and projects that were proposed. When we get to County Council, will there be more of identification, uh, Mr. Morrow, as to what recommendations and what projects we are referring to? Uh, Mr. Kelly? Thought I escaped that one. <laughs> no, sorry. Uh, through you, uh, Chair, to, to the warden. Um, we are trying to do that. I think, I think we need to clarify a few things on this one. This is, it's a, it's a two-pronged, if not three-pronged approach. The province is, is requesting letters or requests for interest. And this is what we're, we're, we're interested in funds. And then from there, I think there will be a more of a, another actual application for dollar amounts. So we are expressing our interest in getting monies and this is why, uh, and this is what for. Uh, we're a step ahead of, I think, many municipalities because we've actually gone through a service delivery review and a planning services delivery review that identify significant changes we can make using this fund to move forward in the implementation. Uh, as, the, as the resolution states, there is a financial component to the implementation. I think it's 35% that we'll have to um, upfront or fund some of these things. If we just go with strategies, the, the government of Ontario will pay for the entire shot. So um, we are long way around, Warden. We are looking at different ways and different dollar amounts we can put to this. But again, uh, these things are, up, I think Paul used the word, it's a big gray area <laughs> to, to determine what funds will go where and what the, what the government will actually fund. So we will try to um, paint a different picture, but not pigeonhole us into a certain, certain, um, certain little box, paint us into a certain little box that will, will allow us to be a little more broad when we actually get to the application stage. I think I've captured that, Paul, but if you have more comments. Um, Madam Morton. Thank you, Chair. And through you to Mr. Kelly, that does help me if we are in fact just sending a letter of interest at this point. I'm just thinking that we bring this to County Council in the month, you're going to, the same question is going to be asked, what are we recommending? So if, if as of the 24th or whatever of February, we don't have to have that very specifics at that point, then that's great. But is this, so I'm trying to read this, is this a letter, we have to send a letter of interest by March 15th or do we have to fill out an application by March 15th? Can, That's a very answer. good point because yeah. this does say complete an application. So at the, at the through you chair, so at the time of, of writing this and we're still learning a lot, I, we have to be clear, the guidelines weren't exactly clear. So we're, we're working through this application booklet and the rules and the guidelines. So we will be clearer uh, by that date as, as Mr. Morrow mentioned up until yesterday, the, our, uh, our advisor was still trying to find out information for us. And, and that still wasn't clear as of yesterday. So um, hoping for better clarification, we have a couple of weeks. And um, although the resolution won't change, maybe some of the background to County Council may, might be updated at that time. Mr. Morrow. Chair, oh, thank you, Chair. If, with committee's indulgence, what I would um, commit Craig to is that each one of these headings that we have, uh, what he likes when I do that, that each one of these um, uh, project areas we would write a brief presentation included in the county council report in terms of a description defining what the initiative would look like. Um, you will still see though at county council, it will be broad enough to ensure that the county of Renfrew continues to have flexibility in our application. So it gives us some room to maneuver should we be approved. But we will better define each of the headings in the county council report with a couple sentences outlining what that would look like for the county of Renfrew. Does that meet with committee's approval? Yeah, I think that would be very helpful, Paul. Um, the warden is absolutely correct. You're gonna get all the same questions, but from 17 instead of seven. So that would definitely uh, that would definitely be helpful. Yes, Craig. I, I just want again, which I normally would do, we're not committing the corporation to anything at this time. This is an expression of interest. And I think we, that, that is part of Paul's report is that if and when approved to move forward in the situation, that would come back to committee and council for uh, the actual committal to a program in the future. So I just wanted to, to reassure council, we're not committing to dollars or anything else. We're just committing to move forward in the process uh, with these short timelines that, that we're given. Excellent. Uh, Councillor Donahue. Um, I thought I was right on top of that, right up to that last comment, because the, the recommendation says that the application must be submitted by March 15th. So I'm, I'm 
I'm now confused between our letter of interest and our application. Are they the same thing? Are they a distinct thing? Are there different timelines? If I could, it's an act, yeah. if it, it's an application for an expression of interest. That's the, the it's actually an expression of interest as I believe, Paul, unless you learned something. Yeah, in the last sorry, days. And, yeah. sorry, I was just working with the, the guidelines that we had um, and I read the word application. So it could be an application for an expression of interest, but I, I can, I'd have to clarify that. Okay, but this also, um, just in case it, the application has to be in by March 15th, uh, this, this sort of covers us off for, for all, uh, yeah. for anything that goes on in the next couple of weeks. So I think leaving that word in, whether it's an actual application or an application for a, a, as interest, I think that 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 just makes it easier on staff to have that approval. I'm just actually looking it up here. I'm, I, you know, when we were doing this last week, I'm pretty sure I read the word application to be submitted by March 15th. And I have the guidelines right in front of me. Warden? Just while Paul's doing that. So, you know, if it was strictly a letter of interest, you know, then you don't have, I don't think we need to be so specific as to identify exactly what the, the, the proposal would entail. But if it's an actual application, I think then we need to be a little bit more um, exact on what it is we're going to be asking for. Just so the County Council knows. I mean, I, you know, so, I, again, I agree with Paul. We don't want to pigeonhole ourselves, but at the same time, we need to have some kind of an idea. Councillor Hunt. Yes, through you, Chair. Uh, we've had um, a few discussions with them, and our understanding is that it has to be an application that would be assessed on its merits. So I'm thinking uh, we're going to have to be specific in order to win it. But now that's our understanding at the township level. Thank you. Chair, if I may, Chair, I, can I yeah. share my screen? Sure, go ahead. I think I have the answer. All right. Can everyone see program timeline? So March 15th, submit your expression of interest and in any supporting document to the um, Transfer Payment Ontario. And then we get into May and then we learn whether your application is approved. This is where the gray. So they're asking us to submit an expression of interest. And then in May, we're going to learn if our application is improved. Even they use the terms interchangeably. Oh. <laughs> so it's not helping us. And then in August, we're going to review the stream, submit an internal project status report. So that's what we're looking at. Uh, this is as clear as mud. So March 15th is to submit your expression of interest in any supporting documentation. And then in May, we learn, learn whether your application is approved. So I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. Um, Well, perhaps between today and County Council, uh, we could get some clarity on this. But as the resolution sits right now, again, I think that this, uh, this allows for staff, just in case an application does have to be in, it, uh, it gives that authority. So Chair, I believe you have a number of hands up. Oh, can you unshare your screen, Paul? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Sorry, I just had really wonky internet there. Uh, all right, Warden. So obviously this still has to go to County Council for approval. Um, so I would just suggest that we, if you would like to be more specific, just amend the recommendation to read that staff be directed to complete an application slash letter of interest, blah, 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 blah. I leave it sense. at that. And then by the time we get to County Council in, in another two weeks, um, there's no doubt in my mind that, that um, Paul and Craig will have much more detailed information. Okay, and if we may, can we say expression of interest and, and mirror their terms, ma'am? Yeah, I think that's the way to go. Okay. Okay, uh, Councillor Donahue. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to extend to staff. Uh, I understand now the confusion. Uh, the confusion doesn't emanate from here. It emanates uh, from the province. All I can think is perhaps, uh, given that there are so many programs being unfurled by the province right now, perhaps all of the experienced uh, um, um, procurement or, or um, uh, funding delivery folks uh, have been reallocated to other departments because it is difficult for me to understand how they use interchangeably an expression of interest and an application. Uh, I can submit an expression of interest that I would not perceive to be an application or typically that is what my expectation would be. Agreed. Um, so the mover and seconder, are you all right with that friendly amendment? I think it was Councillor Bros and... I think it was me. And I think I think it was Brian too. Okay, so if you guys are are good with that, we'll just we'll um, just so we, we're covered off for for all uh, all contingencies here. All right, then at that I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Thank you. All right, Paul. And now you've got information item number six. Thank you, Chair. Uh, information item number six is the a business case that was approved by uh, health kitty committee yesterday emanating from uh, provincial direction uh, for additional screeners. Um, Shelly gave a fantastic um, update and she is on the finance and admitty, uh, admin um, uh, committee meeting here today if she would like to add in chair. Yes, by all means. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, through you to the FNA committee. Um, so uh, the next step uh, in terms of managing COVID in the long-term care homes is a direction from the ministry uh, that all homes start uh, rapid testing. So as you are all well aware, our uh, staff and our visitors, whether they're essential caregivers or general visitors, are tested um, frequency varies depending on the zone that we're in, um, et cetera. Uh, but with uh, um, the PCR testing, which means that swab, uh, which we test our own staff on site, goes to a public health lab for us typically in Ottawa. And it has long been a concern that the delay in getting those results at times it's a week or sometimes closer to two weeks. The whole idea with rapid testing is in addition to doing the swab on site, and it won't be just for our residents now, it will be expanded to all of our essential caregivers. And again, uh, each resident in, in a long-term care home is permitted to designate up to two essential caregivers. So for 346 residents, we could have close to 700 essential caregivers. And then there are the general visitors. So for example, if a resident had a family, you know, children of six or eight, um, two may be designated as essential caregivers and the other four or six uh, could, and all of their family members would be general visitors. So the change is that we not only swab our staff, we swab our staff and all visitors and we do the testing, point of care testing on site as well. It takes 15 minutes to get a result. And uh, when that result <clears throat> is negative, that's part of the screening process, uh, then the visitor is allowed to go into the home. So consequently, we need staff in order to do that. And so um, the costs as outlined in the business case are um, funded by the ministry, uh, the provincial funding that we will have. As we indicated in the business case, there's two streams that we can use to apply for this. And um, so we did include the maximum liability for the full year, again, not knowing how long we'll have to do this, uh, but it would be close to 156,000 for each home, uh, but again, 100% covered by provincial funding. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions uh, for Shelley on the screening? We had a very fulsome report yesterday about this and I really appreciate it. Um, Shelly, it's, you know, it's just one more layer in the, in the scheme of COVID. So thank you for this. All right, and Paul, finally, number seven. Well, I, I believe I referenced uh, number seven there earlier on in the admin report where we had provided the information um, to members of council that were eligible to serve 
uh, as a representative on the Eastern Ontario Regional Network. There are three positions open as that report had indicated. Um, we have a number of elected officials that uh, are eligible to sit on that board. Um, that would uh, entail um, those eligible members of council uh, to come to the March 12th uh, virtually um, and make a presentation to the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus and then there would be a vote held. Um, we did have two names that came forward um, as recently as um, last night that has, that has changed. And we have one, Chair Murphy has agreed to represent the County of Renfrew and put her name forward. So Chair, if I may, I'll read the recommendation. Thank yes, you. Please. That the Finance and Administration Committee recommend that County Council, um, that County, that County, sorry, that Committee recommend to County Council, Councilor Murphy, be submitted to the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus to stand for election to the Board of Directors for the Eastern Ontario Regional Network. Sorry, I fumbled that one. That's okay. Can I get a mover and seconder, please? Moved by the Warden, seconded by Councillor Sweet. Is there any discussion? Yes, Councillor Dunahue. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it is a moot point now because uh, there is only going to be uh, uh, one essential nominee uh, from uh, the County of Renfrew for this position and certainly is subject to a competition amongst all of those that would be eligible. Uh, I just wonder though for future um, uh, if it would be uh, perhaps uh, a uh, better process uh, if there were uh, multiple uh, uh, people interested, uh, eligible uh, councillors interested uh, if in fact we might be better uh, having them make presentation to council and advancing one name, it seems to me that it could be problematic uh, in, uh, if you will, uh, identifying multiple parties uh, from the county of Renfrew uh, that I think would uh, uh, certainly rise, raise the, the, uh, the issue of the potential of splitting votes, et cetera, that I'm not sure it's in our interest to have several nominees. As I said, it has become moot uh, this year for this one. And all of these comments uh, are completely removed from this year and from the potential candidates named. It has nothing to do with them. This could be five years from now. Uh, but it just seems to me that that uh, a more efficient means of doing this would be to, to, to nominate one uh, person from uh, the county of Renfrew for any future uh, election. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you, but uh, you know, something to think about moving forward. Uh, Councillor Sweet. Bob, you're on mute. Thank you, uh, Chair. Yeah, I, I certainly support this uh, for a whole host of reasons. And I think the general discussion that we've had in the last hour or so with regards to <clears throat> the lack of broadband or connectivity or uh, all of that sort of stuff is, 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 uh, is quite evident. Um, as you probably are all aware, I sat on the ERN board and uh, for about six years. And uh, I'm proud to say that we've, we've moved the yardstick somewhat uh, on that particular situation. But um, for a whole host of reasons, there was a change in the general direction of the board. And uh, I was taken off that board along with others. And that was a way back about eight years ago, nine years ago. And I can tell you, uh, one of the concerns I raised at that time uh, was who's looking after the interests of Renfrew County? And I was told at that time that that's all covered off. Uh, the uh, the co-chair, uh, Mr. Gary King from Peterborough County, was looking after our interests. I would have to say to you, given the general discussion that I've heard, heard that uh, perhaps it's absolutely key and essential going forward that we have a voice at the EORN. And uh, I, I, I want to say thank you to you for putting your name forward. Uh, good luck. Um, I know the, the, the process is uh, quite involved down there. I did sit in on that uh, about, what, two, three years ago. Um, I kinda, my heart kind of wasn't in it type of the old, but anyhow, um, I, I didn't make it to the, to, to the board. But I think it's key and crucial that our interests, because we are different uh, in terms of the topography of the, the county of Renfrew, and I'm not sure where the EORN uh, and I think Jim Pine's a great guy, as, as is Lisa Severinsen, but I don't think uh, David Fell and those folks down there really understand the challenges that we have in 
in Renfrew County. And uh, I wish you the best and, and good luck as you go forward with that particular uh, uh, opportunity to represent Renfrew County. I think it's a big, big task. And uh, uh, I, I'll be interested to see how you make out. But good luck and all the very best. But I think it's crucial that we get uh, some representation on the board. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for your support, Bob, and I, I am up to the challenge. Um, uh, Warden. Thank you, Chair, and I just want to um, add my comments to this. I'm thrilled that you've put your name forward. There's a lot of work to be done, and that you're willing to do that is fantastic. Um, you know, to remind people, too, that you sat on the Eastern Ontario Awards Caucus for three years. You're not an unknown. People know how hard you work. They know that the connection, connections that you have, and... Um, I'm, I'm feeling very, very positive about it. We'll do everything that certainly I can to uh, see that uh, election comes to, uh, to the right conclusion at the end of the day on uh, March the 12th. Thank you, Warden. I, I think it's a, it's a good day. That's my dad's birthday. So I'm, I'm hoping, you know, with his luck. Um, all right, anything, did I get a mover and seconder? I don't think I, did I, Connie? We did, yes, sorry. Yes. Um, any further discussion? And I really I appreciate all of your support. And uh, I promise I will do the best I can uh, with the warden and the CAO's help to make sure that I'm up to date with what's going on with EURN. Because as the warden said, you know, I sat on the caucus for three years, uh, but I have been off the caucus for more than a year. So I just want to make sure that I have all the information so that I can do uh, Renfrew County proud in my, uh, in my presentation on the 12th. So thank you. And with that, I will call for the vote. All in favor. Thank you. All right. Um, can I get a mover and seconder for the report as a whole? Moved by Councillor Rose, second by Councillor Peckett. Anything further on Paul's report? Seeing none, all in favor. All right, and uh, before we move on, to the corporate services report. Um, I'd like to take a 10 minute break. Uh, so we will resume just, just before 11 o'clock if that's all right with everybody.
Welcome back, everyone. And at this time, I will turn this over to Mr. Foss with his departmental report. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, members of the Finance and Administration Committee. So my report begins on page 15 of your package. And of course, item number one is the uh, Camp Lutherland tax exemption request. And of course, you've had a delegation uh, pre <clears throat> presentation this morning on this very issue. Uh, just uh, for uh, the purposes of, uh, of presenting some of the history, my report uh, just uh, references the fact that this issue came forward at our November uh, meeting. Uh, during that particular meeting, members of the Finance and Administration Committee recommended that we not approve this request. And this request went that uh, forward to uh, County Council where it was returned back to this committee. Uh, following the delegation this morning, Councillor Peckett asked uh, for some of my comments with respect to the delegation. And so I offer those this morning. Uh, <clears throat> number one, the principles that we presented uh, our recommendation not to approve this request in November have not changed. Um, <clears throat> I guess the second comment I would make is that uh, although it's rather insignificant dollar wise, again, uh, back to the principles that we presented, we do not believe as staff that this is an appropriate use of municipal tax policy. As we all know, uh, the granting of an exemption for one ratepayer simply shifts the burden onto other ratepayers within our collective municipalities. And so all ratepayers would then share a portion of this exemption, whether or not those ratepayers were in support of this particular organization or not, they would have no choice through our tax policy, but to contribute. Although it's a very small share, they would be contributing uh, some share toward this tax exemption. Uh, following the delegation this morning, I believe it was Councillor Donahue that uh, raised a potential concern with respect to fairness. And I think there was a discussion about, you know, the Boys and Girls Club and whether or not they were paying full taxation for their properties and could they access the same exemption. And of course, this exemption is specific to religious organizations and therefore uh, they would not enjoy that opportunity uh, to have some sort of an exemption. <clears throat> but since Camp Lutherland charges for uh, some sort of fees to attend camp or to rent some of their properties, there's also a competitive disadvantage by granting a tax exemption for this organization where you have commercial organizations that are also running summer camps or trailer parks or whatever the case is that are not entitled to have this same sort of exemption and therefore a competitive disadvantage. Uh, the fourth point that I would raise, and I'm glad that uh, our presenter this morning indicated the volume or activity levels with respect to the camp. And I believe there was a slide that indicated there was 105 children that attended a kid's camp. Uh, there was another 88 children that attended other forms of camps throughout the summer. And in addition to that, they have 470 rental agreements with other individuals to attend that camp property. So if we're looking at quantum, the $1,150 in exemption that we're talking about, if each one of those renters or campers that are charged a fee for those activities uh, participated in this, it would be $1.73 per camper or renter would cover the cost of the exemption that we're talking about this morning. And finally, I believe that we have, uh, or you have uh, in your package, a petition uh, that at the time was signed by, um, I forget how many it was, but our presenter this morning indicated there was 120 names that were listed on that, position, that particular petition. Uh, and certainly an awful lot of effort went into gathering uh, names and supporting a petition for this $1,150 exemption. But if each one of those petitioners were to contribute $10, uh, they would cover the full cost of the, the value of the exemption that we're talking about this morning. Uh, so my position on this has not changed and I would recommend that based on all of the principles we brought forward in November, that Finance and Administration Committee uh, once again uh, not approve this request for exemption. Item number two is uh, 
and attached as appendix two is the treasurer's statement of remuneration and expenses at December the 31st, 2020. Item number three deals with our provincial offenses court, and on a monthly basis, we bring forward a workload chart for you. I uh, just want to highlight for you at the, the very bottom row of the chart should indicate January of 2021. We are not comparing September, October, November, and December with January of 2020. It is January of 2021. At the top of the next page, page 17, uh, in January, our committee uh, noted uh, that there was a decrease of about 20% in the total number of charges uh, that were uh, received in 2020 compared to 2019. And we highlighted for you the fact that that followed an 18% decrease in 19 over 2018. Our committee uh, directed the uh, warden to send a letter to the Honorable Sylvia Jones, Solicitor General, seeking clarification on this substantive increase or decrease in the number of fines that were dispensed in Renfrew County in 2020. Uh, I do want to reference for you uh, today uh, our memorandum of understanding that we have signed with the Ministry of the Attorney General and that dates back to transfer in 2001 and specifically Article 2 uh, one seven, which states the entire justice process from the laying of charges through to final disposition of appeals shall continue to operate independently and free from political intervention. And it is that particular statement that uh, uh, has me somewhat concerned in the request to have the warden sign a letter. And so I present that to the committee this morning and uh, just ask if there would be a reconsideration uh, behind the direction to send that letter uh, to uh, the Solicitor General. Also in January, our committee was looking for a, a, a five-year review of the total number of charges from 2016 to 2020, and that chart is presented for you on page number 17. At our January, uh, item number four is a letter to MPAC and at our January committee uh, meeting, uh, members noted that of course there was not a reassessment that took place as planned by MPAC in 2020. And yet of course our total charge, our invoice from MPAC uh, changed very slightly in 2021 versus 2020. Uh, so there was direction that the warden uh, send a letter um, seeking clarification on why the fees remain as high as they do. And in fact, a lot of those assessment related activities did not take place in 2020. And we have attached as appendix three, the letter uh, sent uh, by the warden. Item number five, also in January, of course, we brought to your attention uh, as we were moving into our budget workshop, the fact that we did receive a letter uh, from the Renfrew County and District Health Unit uh, as an obligated municipality with a funding increase uh, for of 8.5% in 2021. And that followed a funding increase of 10% uh, in 2020 over the 2019 year. And uh, this committee uh, requested that the warden send a letter seeking further clarification and explanation of uh, the, the nature or the reason behind these increases. And we have attached as appendix four, a copy of that letter. Uh, item number six begins resolutions. And I wonder, Madam Chair, if uh, you would like me to just stop there before I move into resolutions. Yes, please. <clears throat> Thank you. We'll go back to information item number one, the tax exemption request. I see none. Okay. Um, oops. Siri. My apologies. Um, so I'm not sure what to do with this now. Um, as you know, Bonashir Valley did grant it. So it's a bit disappointing, but anyway, uh, item number two. Item number three, the POA workload. Warden, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I certainly understand uh, Mr. Foss's um, uh, reluctance for me to send a letter, but I'm wondering whether or not um, it would be appropriate for us to ask the uh, the staff sergeant of the Upper Ottawa Valley, maybe Killaloo and 
Redfrew and whoever, just to, you know, um, give us an update. Certainly, um, Staff Sergeant Newfeld made a presentation to Laurentian Valley Council uh, a couple of weeks ago, and um, it was it was enlightening. Some of the information that we have, you know, the fact that uh, Upwater Valley is only 76% staffing level and that um, a significant drop in patrol hours due to uh, officers being off um, and quarantine out of uh, caution, abundance of caution. But I think that may be a way of perhaps getting our point across in a less, um, you know, not less direct way with the ministry. I think that's an excellent idea. Councillor Donahue. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm actually not persuaded uh, that uh, I share the same concerns uh, as Mr. Foss. Certainly, we were talking here about the Solicitor General as opposed to the Attorney General. Uh, we were also talking about metadata. Um, I think that um, the worst case scenario in my mind would be that uh, Minister Jones, uh, Solicitor General Jones, uh, might decline to answer, um, but uh, I am I am certainly disturbed, recognizing here that uh, it's not my intent to weigh in uh, on the the uh, meeting out of justice itself. Uh, but we have data in front of us uh, that uh, I would find it uh, absurd to think that the ministry itself, and in fact the uh, government caucus and the government itself, uh, would certainly be looking at data likewise. Uh, across the province and in making inquiries thereof. Uh, I also acknowledge that um, uh, the Solicitor General would be the appropriate place, bearing in mind that uh, also, particularly in COVID, uh, the uh, inspectors uh, at uh, Renfrew County District Health Unit do also have uh, authority to lay Provincial Offences Act charges, as do, uh, I believe, um, uh, the uh, uh, conservation officers, the uh, the natural resources conservation officers, etc. Uh, but uh, we have seen the data before that the single largest um, number of POA uh, offenses laying of, of fines uh, is through the Solicitor General's office. We are seeing a substantial drop and in particular when you're seeing it all the way back to 2016 uh, as I had indicated, it is certainly a possible outcome uh, that we have seen a dramatic decrease in, in the incidence uh, of non-compliance with provincial statute, but I think that that's a remote likelihood. Uh, so I, I'm, I am not persuaded that I uh, share the same concerns at all uh, with respect to us interfering with, uh, with justice. Uh, this is ensuring, uh, certainly picking up also on the comments of uh, Warden Robinson, I'm not sure that I heard that uh, had, had been party to uh, whatever committee perhaps uh, listened to those data points uh, when she had suggested that uh, our staffing was, was much below the full complement here with respect to uh, OPP, et cetera. I think that there's a, a um, unique opportunity here because, uh, of course, each one of us at the lower tier are responsible for policing. The upper tier is not. However, the upper tier is what is seeing these charges. Uh, and if, if, uh, if it is not to, to uh, um, utilize this data for specific purposes, then I'm not persuaded why we are even presented the data. So given the substantial difference, uh, I am, I am uh, still uh, of a mind uh, that, uh, that the, minister, that the uh, warden rather uh, send correspondence recognizing in my mind, I think the worst uh, case scenario is the Solicitor General declines to answer. Thank you for that. I believe the warden was speaking about a, a delegation at her own council table in Laurentian Valley. Yes. Um, thank you for the clarification, Warden. And uh, Councillor Donahue, I do not disagree with you. I, I think that we, uh, we had some lofty uh, discussion on this at our last meeting. And I also think, I think it could be two pronged. I'd love to hear from our staff sergeants, uh, but at the same time, yeah, I think a letter to uh, Minister Jones is, is in order. Um, I'm not, Paul, do I need, um, do I need, to call for a vote, like put a motion forward again, or? No, unless you, unless you put a motion forward to rescind that original direction of committee, then the direction stands. Okay, thank you for that. Anything further on number three? We will move on to number four, MPAC. 
And number five, the health unit letter. Thank you for doing that, Warden. And now, Mr. Foss, we can move on to resolutions, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just with respect to information item number one, and I, I may be seeking some clarity from our, our CAO clerk on this item, but of course we have a resolution that went forward uh, to not approve this exemption, went to County Council and was referred back to this committee. And I believe uh, it would we would be seeking one of three things. Um, uh, this resolution to move forward to County Council once again, in, in that we not approve this exemption to amend this resolution or a, a motion to, uh, to defer uh, and uh, not, not deal with this particular matter. But uh, Madam Chair, if you will, I might ask our uh, CAO just to uh, provide some guidance on this. Definitely, thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. So if the committee recalls, this motion was uh, referred back to committee. So there is no council direction on the particular motion. So in reviewing our procedural bylaw, I believe that a committee has the option to um, 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 either uh, um, just table the recommendation that is currently in front of us um, and not um, pursue it, or um, it can be brought back to council as is um, with the information that we received from uh, our delegation today. And we can note that uh, the uh, recommendation was, desert, uh, was, a, was um, deferred and referred back to council. Um, again, on today's date, we heard information from uh, Count, uh, Camp Lutheran representatives and the resolution comes forward again as is because there was no change to it uh, as a result of the refer referral back to committee. Well, and I think because it was county council that referred it back, I think that it needs to go to county council again. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay, so in that case, I don't need any, I can just. No, we will indicate in a staff report, in the county council report that as per council's direction to refer it back at the committee, um, it was referred back. We had a delegation, we'll outline what occurred today and then indicate that there was no further direction or amendments to the um, amendments to the uh, original recommendation. Okay, um, Councillor Brose. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I just for clarification, would the presentation that was uh, done today by the uh, delegation, would that be included in the uh, County Council report that all members of council could uh, review that in full? We can include that report, sir. Thank I you. Think that would be very uh, helpful. I, I'm, I'm wondering if, um, if we do need to recommend, if we need direction to staff though, to uh, move it forward to County Council as is. I would think we we should. Yeah, uh, Councillor Donahue. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just in in uh, in echoing uh, perhaps the uh, CAO's comments, uh, as opposed to to taking the position that no changes or no amendments were made, I would uh, I would highly recommend that in fact uh, there be an affirmative uh, in that the committee uh, essentially um, abided by the direction provided in. Uh, in November or something to that effect, uh, not that we, uh, it would be uh, advisable in my opinion, not to suggest that we kicked it down the road again, but that we are once again recommending that it not be approved. Okay, so I need a mover and a seconder for staff direction. Um, Chair, if I may, I believe um, um, Councillor Donahue is actually suggesting a resolution that the, the uh, committee reviewed it and uh, further recommends it be returned uh, to council as is and so with the uh, support, I believe is what you're saying, um, Councillor Donahue? With the recommendation of, of confirmation, uh, I don't wanna be too wordy. Ultimately, we are abiding by the recommendation from November that it not be approved. Okay. But including certainly, uh, since, there would, since Councillor Brose's uh, recommendation on forwarding that information, I think is appropriate. Uh, that probably should be part of the uh, resolution directing staff uh, that uh, this be brought forward again, but include that information, but that we confirm the, the recommendation of November. Yes, Warden. Thank you. I'm sure the information um, that we received this morning could be 
part of the background, but I, um, I'm definitely in support of um, sending the original resolution back to County Council for consideration. With, with extra background information. Well, well, all of our resolutions have background, right? So just- No, 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 but the, but the presentation? Yes, the, including yeah. in the background that will be provided to County Council will be the, the slide deck that we, was, we uh, viewed today. Okay. Um, so can I get a mover and seconder for that, please? Moved by Councillor Donahue, seconded by the warden. Any further discussion? All in favor? Okay, that carries. Um, all right, Mr. Foss, resolutions, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so item number six begins uh, resolutions uh, and the very first one deals with an increase to our stop loss threshold. And that is that the Finance and Administration Committee recommend that County Council approve a recommendation from Cowan uh, Benefits Consulting to increase the stop loss threshold on our current program from $10,000 to $15,000 at the next session of County Council. On November the 13th, uh, the Municipal Benefits Committee met, and that is representatives from the County of Renfrew, along with many of the lower tiers, who all participate in our group benefits plan. Uh, we heard a presentation from Cowan Consulting about this particular issue. Um, and think of it really as a, sort of an deductible on your uh, insurance program to increase that deductible from 10 to $15,000. Um, and so members of the Municipal Benefits Committee voted in favor of this, but of course, as the lead organization, it must come forward to County Council uh, to be endorsed. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, currently, of course, as I, uh, I've written on page number 19, that there is a current large amount pooling threshold of $10,000 per individual for in-Canada healthcare claims. Uh, any of those claims in excess of $10,000 are reinsured and removed from the claims data used to calculate our renewal rates. And so this particular recommendation by Cowan uh, has uh, an estimated impact of reducing uh, the entire cost of our claims by $189,000, which will ultimately translate uh, into uh, very favorable impacts on our uh, manual life insurance rates. Uh, and of course, we're doing this on a, um, uh, a, um, a kind of a surplus or reserve benefit program with manual life. And of course, uh, if in fact this move that they are recommending bears fruit, we should see uh, an impact on our, our manual life benefit rates beginning in January 1 of 2022 and forward. Uh, they're not recommending any changes to those rates for the very first year following the move, looking for some experience uh, before they, uh, they make a recommendation on those rates. So that, Madam Chair, is the... Uh, recommendation before committee this morning. Thank you. So I'll ask for a mover and seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Hunt, seconded by Councillor Bros. Any discussion? Councillor Donahue. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I have to attest to being somewhat confused. And Mr. Foss did, uh, as soon as he threw in the word deductible, uh, it, it started to become a little less uh, uh, translucent, perhaps, if not opaque. Uh, so if I'm to understand uh, those claims uh, up to $10,000 currently um, are contained within our insurer, uh, anything in excess of that, then part of the premium that we pay, the insurer is then paying uh, to assign risk to a, a larger insurer that has a much larger pool, I guess, I don't want to be careful because pool is certainly used often in this, uh, but so that that risk is, is more widely distributed. Uh, so in this instance, if that is raised to 15,000, um, that will essentially decrease uh, the, the premium, if you will. Am I, am I grasping that correctly? That's, that's the road I was going down. I thought that this was like upping your deductible to reduce your insurance. 
And that's that's exactly uh, okay. the situation before you. It's uh, think of the stop loss coverage as your deductible. So uh, the plan is currently uh, paying for that first $10,000. If we move that to a $15,000 uh, deductible, if you will, rather than stop loss, uh, we will benefit from lower uh, premium rates from the reinsurers on our health program. And so uh, they've done an analysis of the nature of the larger claims and are indicating that uh, we have an opportunity to see total claims cost decrease by about $190,000 um, if, we're, if we're able to move this deductible higher. And so that savings uh, from our reinsurers should allow for decreases in our premium rates. And although they won't be experienced in 2021, because we the, the Municipal Benefits Committee did not vote to do that, but rather to implement those savings beginning in 2022. So we will analyze, if you will, uh, the estimates of savings from this move throughout 2021. And if in fact they come to fruition, we should see uh, those savings translated into the 2022 fiscal year and beyond. Thank you. Anything further? Councillor Hunt. Yes, uh, through you, Chair, to uh, Mr. Foss. Where does the money come from to pay the deductible? Uh, that's that's uh, through our existing rates that we're paying uh, to Manual Life. So Manual Life, essentially, our our rates are funding that below threshold amount. But Manual Life is going to the reinsurance market to reinsure those higher uh, individual cost claims. And so by upping the deductible, they'll enjoy a savings on those premiums they are paying in the reinsurance market. And therefore, we should see that translated into these lower rates uh, in future years. I see that, but uh, so on the secondary, we should see a decrease, but on the initial going from 10 to 15, will we see a spike? Uh, through you, Chair. So the estimates provided by uh, Cowan Consulting is the net savings are expected at this $189,000 level uh, so if, if in fact that happens, our reinsurers will reduce their rates based on the experience that we see in the, re in the revised plan. Okay, I didn't realize it was net. Thank you. Thank you for that. Anything further? All in favor? All right. Now, user fee bylaw and schedules. Uh, thank you, Chair. So this item is uh, essentially that uh, this committee recommends to Council that a bylaw to establish and require payment of user fees and charges be adopted at the next session of County Council and further that the previous user fee bylaw 18-20 be repealed. Uh, there's only a, one, one single item that is driving this change, but on an annual basis and following our budget deliberations, uh, my office sends out some communications to ensure we gather all of the changes in our user fees that have been uh, uh, reviewed by committee and adopted in the budget. Uh, there is only one, uh, and that is because of the move from the Provincial Offenses Court uh, previously located on Lake Street into this building, we no longer have separate room rental charges for the POA court on Lake Street. And rather, uh, we are moving then to confirm that our room rental fees would be the same as those in our property department at $150 per room. Uh, the level of activity is, uh, is very, very low. Uh, certainly in COVID and construction, it's, it's extremely low in that, in that we're not seeing any activity whatsoever. But this is simply an alignment for the, the POA court to fall into uh, the same uh, user fee charges as we have with the rest of the uh, offices in this facility. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So I'll ask for a mover and seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Rose, seconded by Councillor Hunt. Welcome, Councillor Doncaster. Um, is there any discussion? Councillor Dunahue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you to Mr. Foss. This uh, change, though, is, is it's anticipated that 
uh, potentially the the uh, courtroom itself uh, would be uh, available on those days when it was not hosting uh, POA court uh, for rental, uh, as it has been at 141 Lake Street heretofore. Uh, I'm presuming then that the, the substantial uh, downscaling uh, in in the cost, I believe, now I do acknowledge certainly that it was the court plus, I think, a consultation room or something, um, was 285, and what's being envisioned here is 150. Is that more based on on the size and the uh, the square footage uh, rates uh, within? Um, I'm presuming still seven International Drive. It was considered seven International Drive when it was uh, RCDHU. I'm assuming it will continue to be seven International. Is that uh, is that accurate? Through you, Chair. Uh so I, I believe Councillor Donahue is referring to the top of page 21, where we had a rental fee established for uh, the courtroom and the judicial office that was next to the courtroom. That combined rental rate, uh, which had been approved by previous councils, was $235. Uh, the change down below actually has a separate charge for the courtroom. Uh, and for the judicial office. So in combination, we would now be charging $300 for the same, the same uh, rentable space as we had on Lake Street. Uh, however, you could rent the courtroom only for 150 or the judicial office itself for 150. Uh, we also had a meeting room down on Lake Street that was a boardroom that is, uh, is Obviously, we no longer have a separate POA boardroom, but rather we have other boardrooms within seven or nine International Drive. And so the rates for renting any of those rooms are now, uh, are now equal at $150 per room rental charge. Thank you for the clarification. Is there anything further? All in favor? Excellent. And now number eight, employment bylaw. So item number eight, of course, has a recommendation with a, a number of subcomponents. And what I might do, Madam Chair, is just draw your attention to page 22, where uh, we attempt to explain each one of the, the recommendations in this uh, particular resolution. And of course, uh, during the development of the 2021 budget, uh, council uh, approved that we build a budget to come forward in January with a 1.5% non-union COLA wage increase. And that budget was adopted and approved uh, on February the 1st by County Council. And so following that is a change to the wage uh, grid by 1.5% for all of the positions that are listed within the enclosed document. Item B is a change uh, in student wages. And of course, we do have a new uh, general minimum wage uh, that was changed to $14.25 per hour for those who are 18 years of age and older. And the County of Renfrew has applied a particular formula uh, for the students who are working for us that are coming out of high school on some of the summer student employment opportunities. And that be set at 94% of the minimum wage. And so that under 18 student rate needs an adjustment as well. Uh, this council uh, had approved uh, the change uh, in our um, staffing schedule to include a new position entitled Manager of Human Resources uh, and that it be placed in the group 10 of the salary grid. And uh, this is uh, again, just acknowledging that recommendation by council uh, from the November 25th meeting. Uh, also, uh, there's a housekeeping item to remove the position, uh, which was Director of Human Resources, and that has been removed from this particular grid. Uh, item E is really just a name change, and given that uh, at November the 25th, Council approved the creation of a new Corporate Services Division to include uh, Human Resources Finance, Information Technology, as well as POA. And so this is really a housekeeping item this then to change the title of this position to Director of Corporate Services as opposed to Director of Finance. Item number F, uh, again in November of 2020, Council approved a title change uh, for uh, social services to become community services and therefore a change in the, the uh, position title to Director 
of community services. We are item number G, re removing a position that was formerly held within the human resources department, being an administrative lead hand, and that position no longer exists. And item number H uh, is then a proposed change to the early retiree benefit program. Uh, and just so by way of background, uh, our employment bylaw number one has uh, for a, a number of years now always contained a provision for early retirement benefits for those staff who qualify to retire early under the uh, rules of, uh, of the Ontario Municipal uh, employee, employee Retirement System or OMERS. If you, require, if you qualify to retire early, you have an opportunity to continue with your health and dental benefits until age 65. Uh, however, that particular program always contained a lifetime cap uh, that as most recently as February the 1st, 2016, the cap uh, was moved up to being a $100,000 lifetime limit. Uh, we are attaching as Appendix 6 a proposal that we received from Cowan Insurance Group indicating that the monthly cost to remove this cap would be $11 for single coverage and $31 for family coverage. So just looking at uh, an employee, a non-union employee who retires early, that $31 cost per month would be $374 per year. And I'm giving you some sense of the volume of early retirees that are within this group. Uh, at the end of 2019, we had 17 individuals who were participating in the early retiree benefit group, and we have 18 individuals at the end of 2020. So it's changed by one uh, over the past year. Uh, and during the development of the service delivery improvement project, the SLT team explored a variety of early retirement incentives. And one of the items that was proposed was a move toward uh, removing this cap, if you will, as a further incentive uh, for individuals who had qualified to early retire, but had not made the decision to do that. And it was suggested that this might be a low cost uh, uh, program uh, for us that might help to incentivize early retirement and, and again, to provide us uh, even greater flexibility from a staff level as we attempt to move uh, four or five office locations into this one building sometime uh, in the summer of 2021. Um, I believe uh, that our CAO uh, would like to speak to this issue as well. Uh, and so I leave, uh, Madam Chair, with your indulgence, I would ask him just to, uh, to provide some comments. Thank you, Chair, if I may. Um, Chair, outside of the, the, the uh, service delivery review option, uh, uh, to be frank, I've had a number of staff uh, who are, are preparing for retirement. And um, as you're aware, and I'm not sure Jeff said this, uh, this early retirement benefit ends at age 65. So as people come on it, they go off it as of 60, age 65. So I've had a number of staff talk to me about um, their retirement plans and uh, um, there are a couple of folks that are preparing for retirement um, that would like to leave the uh, organization, but uh, the cap is a disincentive. Um, whether they have had uh, a previous health issue, uh, cancer, um, they've noted to me that some of their drug benefits, um, when they're not eligible to get on the Ontario Drug Benefit Program, um, probably exceed um, the, uh, uh, the $100,000 cap or have the potential to. So knowing the cost, and so you're aware, in 2021, we would have four non-union staff, uh, based on my calculation, uh, that would be eligible. In 2022, we would have six, and in 2023, we would have 10. So a total additional cost to the corporation of $623 uh, for those folks uh, to remove the $100,000 cap. So based on their conversations with me, I had asked Jeff to include this in there. Um, are we going to have a mass exodus of staff? Um, those staff that are going to retire, they're going to retire um, with or without this. But for $623, I thought it was not an unreasonable thing to bring to kid uh, committee and county council for their consideration. 
So I'll leave it at that, Chair. Thank you for that. Uh, so Mr. Foss, would you like to read the recommendation, please? I will, thank you, Chair. Uh, so back to page 21. Uh, recommendation that the Finance and Administration Committee recommends that County Council approve the following changes to employment bylaw number one, effective January 1, 2021. I will highlight for you that the last item that uh, the CAO just spoke to has a start date that is effective March the 1, March 1 of 2021. So all of those items, uh, A through G, are January 1 except for item, the final item, which has a March 1 start date. Rates of pay, uh, item A, uh, a 1.5% wage increase for all non-union staff except students as outlined in schedules A and B. Uh, rates of pay, an increase in student rates as outlined in schedule B. C, the new position of human resources manager be added to schedule A at group 10 in the salary grid. D, removal of the director, human resources position from group 16 in the salary grid. E, title change of the director, finance treasurer, uh, director of finance slash treasurer to director of corporate services. F, title change uh, of director social services to director community services. G, removal of the administrative lead hand, uh, human resources position from group four of the salary grid. And finally, and further, the County Council approved the removal of a lifetime maximum cap for all health and dental claims for non-union employees who retire after March 1, 2021 at the next session of County Council. Thank you. Can I get a mover and seconder, please, to get this on the floor? Moved by Councillor Peckett, second by Councillor Bros. Is there any discussion? Councillor Dunahue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you first uh, to Mr. Morrill, uh, I thought that in your uh, enumerating the uh, the likely uh, over the next three years, I thought you had identified 16 uh, potential uh, um, non-union uh, staff that may retire. Um, but if I understood also, you had, I believe you had said $600, uh, but I think it's closer to 6,000 if they were uh, all family coverage. It's uh, Mr. Foss identified $374 per year. Uh, ultimately, over the three years, it would be 16 people. I just wanted to clarify that first. Sorry, uh, Mr. Maybe I'll ask Mr. Foss to help me with my math then, because um, I have four staff in 2021, six in 2022, and 10 in 2023. And this new rate would only apply to those new staff commencing in uh, in. Uh, in 2020, in March of 2021. Um, the way the bylaw works is those staff that had previously retired, it would not apply to them. Does that- Madam Chair, Madam Chair if, if I might, I, yeah. I, I certainly, uh, I, I'm understanding Councillor Donahue's question. Um, and so the CAO has had really referenced 20 individuals, uh, yeah, but okay. he's looking at the $31.20 increase, but that's on a per month basis. Oh, sorry. So, Thank you. So I did not annualize it. Yeah, $374 potentially by 20 individuals over the three-year period. That would be $7,480 per year once all 20 individuals uh, early retired. Thank you. Thank you. My apologies for that miscalculation. I did it on a monthly basis. Thank you. Uh, I do appreciate that clarity. And, and, and it's not so much germane to the question that I had anyway. I just wanted to make sure that we had the accurate number. Uh, the, the question that I had is, is I know that this was part of our uh, service delivery review uh, initiative and the modernization. Uh, it was my understanding that uh, this was uh, intended to be an inducement uh, whereby uh, some of the efficiencies that we, we anticipate realize could be done through retirement. Uh, that being the case, that that there was a a, um, a benefit uh, to the the uh, corporation of the county of Renfrew uh, was that this would not be on a permanent basis. So, uh, can you provide clarity? Is if is this on an ongoing basis, or is this a temporary measure uh, that will uh, have a time limit? If I may, chair, please. Uh, this is um, different from the original inducement that we had previously talked about in a closed session. Um, the parameters of that original incentive program that we offered were significantly 
I would say more rich. Um, they went to age 70 without getting into the details of a closed session uh, chair, but they were um, uh, the scope of the benefit enhancement that was, was more significant than what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is the continuation of benefits to age 65 um, and uh, the removal of the $100,000 cap. So really what's at discussion here is only the removal of the $100,000 cap. Uh, when I go back to our original discussion around the, the incentive, um, Council Gate provided staff direction to target um, uh, three positions. We were successful with, th with two of those. Um, so that has served its purpose. This is a really, um, there is an element where we can continue to um, encourage folks um, through this ongoing um, removal of the cap but it is only that, the removal of the $100,000 cap. And again, that's why it has limited financial consequences over the three year period. Thank you. Anything further? I see none, all in favor. Thank you. And finally, number nine, Mr. Foss. And number nine is, uh, again, with reference to that meeting that took place, the Municipal Benefits Committee, uh, ourselves, as well as representatives from the lower tiers, uh, had a presentation by Cowan Insurance, which included our renewal of our manual life benefit program. We have attached uh, the renewal document uh, to this. Uh, the increases that were anticipated from that renewal in uh, November were built into the 2021 budget. So council has already adopted that budget in January, sorry, on February the 1st. And so uh, we have provided uh, for the funding uh, to deal with this uh, uh, change in manual life benefit rates. So the recommendation is that the Finance and Administration Committee recommend that a bylaw be passed at the next session of County Council to enter into a service agreement renewal with Cowan Benefit Consulting for the period January 1 to December 31 of 2021. And further, the County Council adopt a bylaw at the next session of County Council to enter into a service agreement renewal with Manual Life Financial for the provision of, ben of a benefits insurance program, that's policy 4704, for the period of January 1 to December 31, 2021. Thank you. Can I get a mover and seconder, please? Moved by Councillor Sweet, seconded by Councillor Hunt. Any discussion? I see none, all in favor. And can I get a mover and seconder for the corporate services report as a whole, please? Moved by Councillor Peckett, seconded by Councillor Dunahue. Anything further on corporate services? Seeing none, all in favor. Excellent. All right, uh, is there any new business? Councillor Sweet. Thank you, well, this is not really a county issue, but I'd like to, to find out uh, from, from those that are in attendance. We were advised by our fire chief that the Ontario Fire College is being closed in Gravenhurst. Uh, and that is going to be a bit of a challenge in terms of costs for the lower tiers. Has, uh, has anyone heard of that or uh, there's a concern out there with that? The closest is a regional training center in uh, uh, Clarence Rockland, which uh, is, is a major expense to, uh, to the lower tiers in terms of training for their, their firefighters. Just curious if anyone has heard this. So uh, our fire chief um, presented on this as well. Uh, unfortunately, our zone, zone six, was meeting the day after our, our council meeting. So I don't, I'm, I have some of an update, but not really an update. Um, this is of grave concern when we can send firefighters to Gravenhurst uh, for about $65 per course. And these private uh, institutions are charging more like $1,500 a course. Mm -hmm. So you are absolutely right, Bob. Uh, I note in my uh, council package for next week, there are, I think I've got four or five resolutions from other municipalities with regards to the closing of the fire college. 
Uh, this is not a popular uh, thing to do. And uh, I think they're hoping that with all these zones having meetings that uh, they'll be able to rally and, and advocate to keep the, the college at Gravenhurst. That's, that's what I know so far. I will tell you that my fire chief husband is in, is not in good humor over this uh, yeah. and is very concerned about his budget ballooning, um, you know, to the detriment of our ratepayers uh, when, you know, this, this is a provincial, uh, partially provincially funded college. Yeah, and as I understand it, uh, Chair, there's a mandated uh, training requirement for firefighters, et cetera. So we're mandated uh, to do this. And uh, uh, they've spent millions of dollars on upgrading the, the training college in Gravenhurst and they're closing it um, uh, with no consultation to the lower tiers or, or the fire departments. This came as a bit of a shock, apparently, but I make everyone aware of that. So it, it's out there at this point in time. So. Uh, yes, it, it, there, and, there, and to your point, point, Bob, there was no consultation with the fire chiefs. And again, to your point, um, it is amazing to me that our small rural uh, fire departments, and I'm not going to call them volunteers anymore, uh, that they have to train to the same standard as any large urban uh, fire department. So that, again, is, is of grave concern. Um, Councillor Hunt. Yes, thank you. Um, the reason that, or my understanding, the reason that it's um, much less expensive than Gravenhurst is because it's provincially subsidized. So I wonder if they go forward with this, do we have to petition the government to subsidize our uh, firefighters who are going to a private um, um, training center? You know, they just have pulled their money out, but maybe if they're just closing that center, what they need to do is reallocate the money. Well, and, and that's a very, very interesting point, Brian. And I think that they would be far better served just to keep the college open than to have bills coming in from, you know, each of our fire departments for, you know, 10 firefighters at $1,500 per, like, it, do, it doesn't make any sense, right? You're, I agree, it's it just seems like the, the discussion though. Yes, Councillor Dunning, you. Thank oh, you, uh, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. No, you did not, it was me. Um, I uh, certainly have not uh, had, uh, um, I have, have uh, requested that uh, the fire chief um, here in Abbas and Roman, the Douglas uh, Fire Department, uh, that they uh, bring forward a report on this. Um, so I'm, I'm, uh, I have to admit that I am I'm not uh, very uh, knowledgeable about this, but I do know that we made a delegation uh, at uh, Roma, uh, I believe in 2018, uh, expressing concern with the, uh, the uh, NFP fire regulations that were being rolled out and the mandatory training that was being rolled, and how, rolled out uh, and how onerous uh, it was going to be for us just logistically um, and geographically, I suppose, uh, in that um, uh, certainly I acknowledge that our firefighters are firefighters, but of course they are volunteer, which means that they are uh, otherwise employed on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, that it would uh, just to go over to Gravenhurst for a week would require them to take holidays, to be accommodated over there. I don't know uh, what the $65 was covering. I'm more inclined uh, to be in alignment with, I believe this is where Councillor Hunt was, uh, is I think that uh, ideally uh, we would have a training center that would be within our zone that people could, that uh, firefighters uh, or new recruits could travel to and travel home each day uh, and seek uh, assistance, uh, just as we seek it uh, for a variety of things now, uh, as opposed to a, a centralized location uh, that is not proximate to us here. Uh, so I think that uh, the, the subsidization is the thing uh, that I am most interested in retaining. Uh, but I think that there is also an opportunity, uh, if Gravenhurst is to close, then to have a facility uh, that would be right here in the Ottawa Valley in Renfrew County. And I know that there have been discussions both with municipal fire departments and others uh, within the County of Renfrew uh, on establishing just that. Um, so prior to COVID, 
uh, Chief Murphy and Jamie Bramberger were in discussions about doing some amount of training through Algonquin College. Uh, I'm not sure where that went, of course, because of COVID, uh, but I think that all of our fire chiefs that were on the, the, um, the meeting through zone six, which would have been on February 6th, I believe, um, or 7th, um, once we get those reports back, uh, and I will check in with our chief to see where it's sitting, perhaps you are absolutely correct, Councillor Donahue, um, could we just send our firefighters to Pembroke for uh, a day or two day course? Uh, Councillor Sweet. Yeah, uh, th th thank you, yeah. So I, I gave our fire chief the, the green light to bring this, th there's a Renfrew County Firefighters, our fire chiefs association. And I asked him if he would take that forward to that association that represents all 16, 17 municipalities and come up with some sort of process to deal with us. I fully realize this is not a county issue in terms of fire, but it affects all 17 municipalities. And how can we deal with this? As far as the $65 is concerned, it's my understanding it, it's all inclusive. It's accommodation and meals uh, for $65. If in fact that is a uh, an impediment to keeping the the, the facility open. Um, it's been sixty five dollars, as I understand it, for years. Okay, uh, why 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 not take a review at six, of the sixty five dollars and and bring it more in line of what is necessary uh, to to accommodate that that need. However, it, it could be also that we could do something locally. And yes, uh, if Algonquin College is the answer, but. I think, I think if the fire chiefs themselves get together and talk about this and bring forward some sort of recommendations for us uh, as, as uh, lower tiers, I think it would be very useful for, for all of us to, to hear what their recommendations would be. Excellent, yes. Uh, I don't know when their next meeting is. Uh, I think the chair of the chiefs is Dan Herbach and of course hiring. He's gone, um, yeah. but so I think, um, you know, I, I think that we should all be bugging our fire chiefs to, um, to have a meeting sooner rather than later through Zoom and uh, see what they can do uh, right here in the county. Yeah. Is there I any further? If, uh, I wonder if um, Garrison, Petawawa and CNL could possibly have a role to uh, play here and, and help out. Who, who is that? Right. So Garrison, they also Petawawa, have, and, and CNL. Because they have their own fire departments. Right. And, and CNL and, does a lot of their own training. So uh, one of the, one of the uh, components of the agreement that the town of Deep River has with CNL is they are providing training to our firefighters. So, good to know. So the capacity is there. Okay. Um, Thank you for letting me bring that forward. I think it's a bit of an issue. It's one of those yeah. sleepers. Uh, it's there, but uh, it'll be on top of us before we know it. And and Bob, I appreciate like you're saying this isn't really a county issue, but when it does affect every single one of us, um, it does kind of become a county issue where at least if we're all on the same page and we start bugging our fire chiefs, then maybe we can make something happen. Sure. So I appreciate it. All right, anything further? Any more and than just, just I'm further on that. Maybe at our county, I know it's not a county issue, but I know the warden meets with John Yakabuski on a regular basis. Maybe that's something that could be brought up as an issue that concerns all 17 lower tier municipalities. I think that's an that's an issue that affects us all. It's just food for thought, warden. I would be surprised if it doesn't come up at the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus as well, because most of the caucus is in zone six, and I know that they were pretty fired up. I'd certainly like to hear from our, our fire chiefs from across the county to see what their, you know, united position is on this and what they were looking for for us to uh, to help out weed lobbying and advocate for whatever. So I'd like to hear from, from them for sure. So just so you're aware, Warden, um, uh, Chief Murphy had a uh, phone call meeting with Robin Jones, 
who of course is the chair of Roma now. Um, she was seeking um, his his thoughts on on the closing. Uh, I, I'm not sure what transpired, but I do know that they had quite a lengthy meeting. So I, I guess Roma has it on there, Ray, just so you're aware. Okay, anything further? Any more new business? All right, we have no closed meeting. Uh, our next meeting is Thursday, March 18th. And we'll ask uh, for an adjournment, please. Moved by Councillor Dunahue, second by Councillor Sweet. All those in favor? Excellent. Let's go have some lunch. <laughs>